this morning have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Cho for the seminar. Uh, Dr. Cho is an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering here at Georgia Tech and has a joint, uh, joint appointment in the Pediatrics Department at Emory University. He recently moved to Atlanta from the Cedar sinai Medical Center in LA where he was an assistant uh, professor at both the Cedar sinai and UCLA. Dr. Cho obtained his PhD from the University of Toronto and went on to do his postdoctoral fellowship at jo Johns Hopkins Medical Institute in the laboratory of Dr. Eduardo Marban. Throughout his career, he has been investigating how the human heart keeps its rhythm, and his team have, has been developing bi biological therapies for heart rhythm associated diseases. Please help me welcome Dr. Chen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. She's the, the poster child of our lab. Um, um, having the faith and vision to join my lab when my lab was nothing more than a little bit of a space with a lot of boxes. So um, I'm very thankful of her. She's amazing. Um, it, so this morning, I want to talk about how to pace the heart with genes and cells. Of course, we're born with the innate mechanism to, to pace the heart uh, with genes and cells. Um, and those, uh, that innate mechanism is shown in this cartoon that actually my cousin drew in about two minutes. Um, and the, each and every heartbeat starts from the signature node uh, that's colored in red in here. And that anatomy location is at the backside of the heart at the junction between the superior and uh, inferior vena cava that's not uh, shown in this uh, cartoon. And that signature node, and I'm going to call this one SA node throughout this talk, the SA node harbors specific and very special, specialized cells called pacemaker cells. And these pacemaker cells do not need any encouragement. They pace, they, they fire an electrical stimulus every time to keep our heart rhythm. And that electrical stimulus uh, spreads around the uh, atrial myocardium, the left, uh, I'm sorry, the right and the uh, left my myocardium, uh, atrial myocardium, because we're looking at the heart from the front. And then arrives at the atrioventricular node. That's another nodal structure, small nodal structure that sits right between the atria and the ventricles. And with a little bit of delay that happens not by chance but by design, the electrical signal spreads down these fiber structures called bundles. That's the right bundle. And then that's the left bundle of his. And then infiltrates the entire muscular my, uh, ventricular myocardium uh, through per Purkinje fibers. And the anatomical um, identification of these structures were actually backward. Dr. Purkinje, back in 1845, identified those very uh, extensive uh, networks in the ventricular myocardium. Dr. Hiss identified his bundles, major bundles of the electrical conduction system. And then Tawa, when he was in Germany, identified the AV node. And about a year later, Keith and Flagg in, uh, in Great Britain um, identified the cyanitro node. These are anatomical um, identification of the cardiac conduction system. The, the SA node as the pacemaker of the heart uh, was published three years later uh, after the anatomical um, um, identification. The reason why I put up this uh, hi historical slide is because the identification of the SA node was uh, done a little more than a century ago. But surprisingly, we know very little about the SA node. And probably because the SA node is so small and a little difficult to access. And this cardiac conduction system going from the SA node to AV node, measure his bundles and the Purkinje system, is universal for all mammalian heart and even in fish heart. So this is a zebra fish. Um, six days after fertilization. And you can even see, and by the way, fish has not two atria and two ventricles, but single atrium and one ventricle. And you can see an atrium and the ventricle beating together. And the conductions, well, because they have a single atria and a single ventricle, they don't have his bundles and Purkinje systems, but they do have an, a sinoatrial node ring at the top of the atrium and the AV atrioventricular node ring in between the uh, atrium and ventricle. So that uh, cardiac conduction system is a, a general 
a, a theme in, uh, in, in keeping the heart uh, beating uh, in mammalians and amphibians. Now, in also frogs, also frogs, yeah, absolutely. Um, and in, uh, in clinical setting, when our heart doesn't beat the way it should, um, and resulting in abnormally fast tachy or abnormally slow bradycardia, either too fast or too slow, it does the same thing at the end. It, it uh, sets up an insufficient time for the mechanical events of ventricular emptying and filling. And when the scenario goes worse and worse, cardiac output drops, the lungs become congested, and the circulation collapses. It's, cardiac arrhythmias are, in fact, uh, the, the disease that claims our lives at the end. It, we could have a congestive heart fa failure. We could have myocardial infarction, ischemic attacks. But at the end, what claims us is the um, uh, electrical disturbances of the heart, uh, arrhythmias. And it afflicts more than 3 million Americans and account for almost half, half a million deaths annually. Um, and it's expensive to address. $3.1 billion paid to Medicare beneficiaries for uh, all cardiac arrhythmia-related diseases in the US alone. And that was actually uh, about a, a 10 years old uh, figure, so it's uh, certain to be a little higher now. Um, what are the modern therapies for cardiac uh, rhythm-associated diseases? And there are three different uh, ways to approach that. And drug therapy um, is the first line of defense. And it's variably effective. And the most problem, the biggest problem with drug therapy is that it addresses one symptom and it encourages or creates another problem that was not there before. So it's bedeviled by arrhythmic uh, events. And for uh, cases where there's ectopic beads in the ventricular myocardium that shouldn't be, then you can go in and burn it using radio frequency catheter ablation. And it's potentially curative in ventricular uh, arrhythmias, but less reliable for more complex uh, and most common arrhythmias, such as atrial fibrillation. And these are uh, abnormal activities in the atria of the heart. When all things fail and you need to pace the heart some way, then uh, you, uh, and then you get uh, implantable devices. And these things are uh, mainly, largely palliative for uh, bradycardias. It could be life-saving for tachyarrhythmias. In all the devices, um, the patients are uh, committed to the lifelong um, uh, um, implantation of the devices and repeated procedures to change batteries once in a while. And uh, it's expensive. And when these things do not work well, you can imagine that catastrophic events uh, uh, can follow. Uh, some of the uh, less common problems are infections. Um, again, the pacemaker devices, ele electronic devices, are uh, made up of a, a generator that uh, stimulates or, or uh, creates electrical uh, uh, shock. And then that electrical signal is related through the wire and uh, has a, a electrical uh, uh, electrode that gets screwed, literally screwed into the heart muscle inside the heart at the, uh, at, at the apex of the right ventricular myocardium. So um, this is the general uh, a device uh, implantation strategy. Infections can happen. And for the cases of pediatric patients, it becomes a little more emotional. Um, there are um, babies who are born with uh, congenital heart defects. And all, most of the time, these are structural disease. Surgeons go in and try to uh, close up whole big holes in the ventricular septum. In so doing, they often uh, they disrupt the cardiac conduction system, and the, and the baby's heart does not beat uh, very well. So then they implant a pacemaker, and the baby's uh, are dependent on, for their life, dependent on the cardiac pacemaker devices. Babies grow, the wires do not stretch. So in, in the pediatric uh, patients, uh, by the time, and that's the fortunate case, by the time the, pa the, the patients uh, uh, reach up to low teens, mid teens, um, they undergo about uh, uh, four to five uh, replacement of the pacemaker leads. And um, when I say replacement, 
they don't take out the old lead. The old leads are still there in the uh, baby's uh, blood uh, uh, vessels. They insert new wires, and the old wires are unscrewed. Because taking out the old wires, it's a little too risky because they, the old wires are uh, already tissue adhesioned uh, to the vessel. So taking out the old uh, wires, uh, you're, you run into the risk of uh, perforation or taking, uh, tearing the vessel. So in one case that I saw, it was a 14-year-old boy where the boy had about um, four wires dangling in his heart, old wires, and then only the, the longest end. Uh, new wire was pacing his heart. So in, in those cases, uh, and other, the adult uh, cardiology, those things motivated us to come up with a device-free way to pace the heart with genes and cells. And um, what are the potential advantages of biological therapy? Well, pacing the heart with exogenous genes and cells um, uh, is highly localizable because genes and cells, by definition, they're the nature's nano and microparticles, they're small. And for pacing, uh, you don't need to deliver these biologicals to multiple areas of the heart. In fact, you don't want to. You want to deliver it in a focal area. So the delivery can be highly localizable. And the therapeutic action is responsible from the first principle, can be responsible to endogenous signal uh, transduction. And that speaks to uh, something called uh, chronotherapic uh, competence. You know, in other words, when we want to run and try to catch a bus, our heart rate has to go up. And um, that needs to, the biological pacemakers um, um, should be or, uh, and could be uh, responsive to the beta uh, adrenal stimulation and acetylcholine um, uh, uh, challenge to slow down the heart rate. And um, if it works ideally, then it avoids all implantable hardware and it could be reversed by conventional therapy. And this part is actually a, an important part because uh, at the very first step of testing this uh, uh, concept in large animals and uh, first in man clinical trials, if it doesn't work as a safety uh, net, we want to reverse it. We want to uh, neutralize it. That can be done quite easily by going back with a radio frequency catheter and burn the injection site. And I'm going to talk about three different strategies in creating, uh, to creating uh, biological pacemakers. Uh, it, we call it uh, biopacer. And these are a ion channel based approach, stem cell uh, derived approach, and then reprogram approach. The first one, the, the ion channel approach, is something that I'm going to go very briefly. And the main idea is that with um, and I mentioned uh, in another cartoon that the cardiac conduction system begins from the sinoatrial node to pace the atrial myocardium and ventricular myocardium. All these different cells, including the, uh, the muscle cells, have their typical action potential profiles. These are membrane potential changes uh, inside the cell. The, the main idea with ion channel approach uh, is to convert a ventricular myocyte action potential to something that looks like the action potential from a cyanotrial node. And there are two key differences between those two action potential profiles. And those differences, and this is a better cartoon of those, uh, this is a ventricular uh, myocyte action potential than that. This, this is pacemaker cell action potential from the SA node. One uh, uh, feature uh, of the hallmark of the uh, myocyte muscle cell action potential is that they're really quiet. They don't fire an action potential un, un, unless they are stimulated to do so. And that quiet and strongly hyperpolarizing uh, force is provided by an ionic current called IK1. And that's called the inward rectifier potassium channel current. So this is getting a little uh, uh, specific for uh, this audience, perhaps. Now, to and, uh, Research done by several groups, uh, including ours, uh, about a decade ago, uh, postulated that if one were to destabilize this electrical break, the cardiac myocytes have everything to pace on its own. And to do so, we created a dominant negative ion channel mutant, um, replacing glycine, uh, tyrosine glycine, GYG, to triple allylines and expressing this triple mutant ion channel, 
uh, was able to suppress the IK1 current by 80%. And that was enough to convert this action potential to something that uh, paces on its own. And that was published uh, in Nature back in 2002. Now, um, this is, so that's one way to, dest so destabilizing this electrical break and having myocyte to pace on its own, that's one way. A complementary approach is to overexpress something that's expressed in the sinoatrial pacemaker cells, but not in muscle cells, uh, uh, regular uh, uh, cardiac muscle cells, and that's called HCN channel. And that HCN channel provides a positive current that slowly depolarizes the membrane potential, and that's, ex uh, that's responsible for this slow um, um, the depolarization called phase four in, in our uh, in, in EP electrophysiology uh, terminology. And that complementary approach um, uh, was played out uh, in, for about uh, five to seven years to, uh, to show that it is remarkably simple to convert the action potential profile from a muscle cell to a pacemaker cell. Uh, perhaps what I can show you here is not all the data that we have and, and other people have pu published uh, on that theme, but to tell you that this, we know so much about the ion channel physiology that we could even convert a non-excitable cell like um, uh, HEK cells to pacing cell. So this was, or fibroblasts even. So we imagined, okay, we'll take human embryonic kidney cells, 293 cell line, and we're going to add some ion channels a minimal complementary uh, of ion channels that will make the hex cells to fire an action potential. To do so, what we have done is to add a sodium channel, which is responsible for the fast upstroke of the action potential profile. And then the HCN channel that's responsible for slow rise of the depolarizing uh, membrane potential. And an inward, inward rectified potassium channel. And we had to have that because sodium channel, once it fires, it stays in the inactivated state. So uh, the membrane potential needs to go down for the sodium channel to recover. And to our excitement, having only those three channels in the HEK cells made some of these cells fire action potentials uh, uh, spontaneously. So this is a, demonstra a demonstration not how, uh, what, uh, how it should be done, but how it can be done. In other words, uh, we're not going to use HEK cells and inject into the patient's heart and, and uh, use that as biological pacemakers because HEK cells will divide all the time and cause arrhythmia. But it, it shows how um, uh, simplistic it is to cause a, a cell to fire extra potential spontaneously. Um, and with all three approaches that I'm going to tell you, I'm going to t uh, also uh, 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 tell you what are the advantages and the and disadvantages of, of, of each approach. And the advantage of the ion channel approach is that once the ion channel is delivered, you don't have to wait anymore. Uh, so you can achieve uh, immediate function. And also, uh, we know so much about the ion channel physiology that the pacing rate can be fine-tuned by making some mutations in the permeation pathway of the ion channel. So um, a rate adaptation uh, can be possible by modifying the ion channel by bio, uh, biophysics, uh, biophysical properties. Now, a problem with this approach is that I mentioned that if a biological pacemaker works well, then it should be able to speed up or slow down its pacing rate depending on the physiological need. And there's no inherent design element uh, with the ion channel uh, approach uh, for us to do so. And to be able to pace uh, the heart for a long term, uh, one would need to use a genome integrating viral vectors uh, for long term pacing, such as uh, um, adeno associated vectors or lentiviral vectors. I think I spilled my coffee, so I'm going to move, uh, I'm going to um, clean up this mess uh, after the talk, but uh, <laughs> make sure that I don't uh, destroy anything here. Okay, the second, 
The second approach to creating biological pacemaker is using uh, pluripotent stem cells. And this is, um, this is uh, done thank you. Um, by uh, using uh, embryonic stem cells or iPS cells. And as we know, embryonic stem cells are derived from the inner cell mass of a blastocyst. And uh, by definition, ES cells can be cultured indefinitely and be derived to uh, give rise to all parts of our body. Now, um, over the last 10 years, the stem cell, the pluripotent stem cell field have moved on and, and uh, became a mature field uh, to the point that the efficiency of getting kydec myocytes from the embryonic stem cells or iPS cells can reach almost about uh, 95 to 98%. And this is a, a um, one of the videos uh, that we collect on a daily basis, uh, I'm sorry, cells that we derive on a daily basis in the lab where uh, we can make carpets of kydec, human kydec myocytes from human embryonic stem cells. And again, these cells are uh, not sorted and their intrinsic efficiency to becoming kydec myocytes is above 90%. And we hypothesize that uh, perhaps we can u utilize, take advantage of this kydec differentiation and spontaneous uh, beating phenomenon of these cells. <laughs> Thank you. And one can make three-dimensional cell aggregates. You can call it kydospheres or spheroids. Um, and these spheroids beat spontaneously. And one of the reasons why they beat spontaneously is not because they are really pacemaker cells, but they are immature cells. Uh, and we reasoned that we could use these three-dimensional spheroids as biological pacemakers once we inject it into the animal's heart. And to do so, we first did an in vitro assay. So we took those spheroids that were uh, beating spontaneously and dropped them onto a monolayer of ordinary kydec myocytes that are quiescent. And you cannot see it, but you have to believe it. This gray area have that monolayer of kydec myocytes uh, isolated from a neonatal rat heart. And we did that experiment on a platform called a multi electrode array um, that can record electrical signals uh, from excitable cells. And this multi electrode array has electrodes, electrode endings uh, throughout this platform. And using that platform, you can measure where is the earliest time of activation of the electrical signal. And here you can see uh, the dark uh, color means zero millisecond, and the lighter color means later, longer um, uh, uh, time frame. So uh, electrical activation starts from here where uh, the spontaneously beating uh, uh, spheroids was dropped and spreads to the neighboring um, uh, myocyte. And we, when we add some lidocaine, which is a sodium channel blocker, um, and something that you get when you go to the dentist's office, lidocaine, addition of lidocaine blocks sodium channels and slows down the propagation of action potentials. So uh, this is uh, before or, and after adding lidocaine. Well, after we add the lidocaine, uh, action potential propagation slows down. Uh, the isochronal map becomes more compact, indicating that these two Sorry, these uh, two different cell types are electrically coupled. Well, I mentioned that we can get 90% of cardiac myocytes from stem cells, but these stem cell derived cardiac myocytes are, in fact, uh, a highly heter heterogeneous population of many different cardiac cell types, including atrial, ventricular, and pacemaker cells. And, um, most of the time, the uh, ratio of, the, of these different cell types are in such that atrial and ventricular cardiomyocytes are the major uh, population and pacemaker cells are the minor population uh, when, we derive, uh, stem, stem, when you uh, derive cardiomyocytes from the stem cells. What we want to do is to um, convince and coerce the stem cells to give rise to more pacemaker cells and less uh, ordinary muscle cells. And we could achieve that utilizing um, some transcription factors that are important for the development of the native SA node uh, during uh, mammalian heart uh, 
uh, uh, formation. And that transcription factor, one of the transcription factors that we have uh, used is called SHOX2. And I'll, I'll tell you more about these transcription factors in the third arm, uh, the reprogramming approach. When we used SHOX2 during the differentiation stage, um, these uh, cells became, uh, higher population of cells became pacemaker cells uh, compared to, uh, relative to uh, the atrial and ventricular myocytes. Taking those cells and not purifying them, these are still uh, uh, sort of heterogeneous population of cells. So uh, this, is, this would be a control where the majority uh, of the cells are ordinary muscle cells that do not pace on their own, whereas the SHOX2 mediated differentiation gives us uh, the, uh, pacemaker cells in, in its majority. We took those cells and injected into uh, red heart and, s and wanted to see if those cells will be able to pace the red heart. And this is an ex vivo. Um, so we would, in we would inject these cell spheroids into the uh, apex of the red heart. Uh, let the animal live for a few days so that these spheroids will integrate and, and uh, uh, couple with host myocardium, bring the animals back, um, open the chest, harvest the heart, and then pace it, and um, do something called optical mapping. And optical mapping is a technique where you use a photosensitive dye to record electrical propagation. So you can see uh, fluorescence change um, uh, as a function of a voltage change. And um, in these hearts, um, this is where we injected the spheroids. This is control heart. This is SHOX2 cell, uh, SHOX2 mediated differentiated uh, spheroids. And uh, here's the rationale. If the, heart is be pa if the heart is paced by its own natural conduction system, the pacing will come from somewhere in the middle or the side of the heart because we added some, uh, uh, we, we uh, cut off the sinoatrial node. So the AV node now works as the secondary pacemaker. So, uh, so that, that brief movie shows that the electrical signal from, uh, starts from here and propagates to the uh, entire uh, myocardium, uh, not where we injected the control cells. But in contrast, the SHOX2 uh, mediated uh, uh, differentiation of uh, um, embryonic stem cells and injection of those cells uh, at the apex caused the heart to be paced where we injected the cell. And we could, so that was one uh, optical mapping data and we followed up with uh, surface EKG to show, in live animals, to show that uh, the heart rate was faster in uh, uh, shocks to injected uh, uh, animals. And the the advantages and disadvantages of, of that uh, approach is that uh, if, we, if this uh, technology matures, we could envision creating an off-the-shelf product. In other words, we create uh, pacemaker cells from the ES or IPS cells and characterize them, characterize their uh, pacing frequency, their longevity, um, um, how they react to pharmacology, all those things can be characterized before we deliver those cells into the animal model or to, to the patient. So uh, off-the-shelf product can be feasible. The problem is, with, at least with the uh, uh, embryonic uh, stem cells, there's ethical con concerns, uh, there's immunogenic problems because these are not the patient's cells. And uh, the risk of teratoma is all still a lingering problem. Uh, IPS can bypass both the ethical concerns and the uh, immunogenic problems. But the problem with IPS is that you first have to take the patient's skin biopsy, convert them into IPS, and then derive cardiomyocytes. And all that process uh, uh, can, will take time, number one. And the IPS generation also uh, creates different cell lines with different characteristics from, e from a single patient. So um, there could be uh, some time and cost related problems uh, with IPS uh, uh, technology. That's not just uh, uh, for this uh, application, but for all, uh, most of the uh, uh, ap uh, therapeutic applications as well. 
The last approach that I'm going to tell you, uh, and this is the most uh, exciting to us, is the reprogramming approach uh, to create the number of pacemaker cells. And I need to tell you something about the sinusoidal node uh, one more time. And this is a fascinating uh, structure. Um, if you think about, well, the whole heart has a little more than 10 billion cells. A little less, uh, less than 5 bil uh, billion cells are muscle cells. And uh, 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 5 to 6 uh, billion cells are non-myocytes. And that's what makes up our uh, mammalian heart. Uh, the pacemaker cells in the SA node is less than 10,000. So to put this into perspective, less than a few, few thousand pacemaker cells in the SA node can pace the entire heart. So uh, it's a diminutive uh, structure, but highly specialized. Um, and the pacemaker cells in the center of the SA node has slow conduction velocity. In other words, the spread of electrical conduction in the SA node is actually much slower than what you would see in the atrial myocardium and ventricular myocardium. And that's a, that's a very important concept in cardiac electrophysiology, and, and it's called source-sync mismatch uh, problem. And that source-sync mismatch is a problem where the signature node, less than 10,000 cells, is such a small structure. How can it pace the, whole, the huge electrical sink uh, 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 of the atrial myocardium and ventricular myocardium? And that source sync mismatch can be overcome by slow conduction velocity, which is sort of protective uh, of the, uh, the sinusoidal node uh, uh, from the highly hyperpolarizing electrical influence from the atrial myocardium. The, um, and the pacemaker cells in the SA node look very differently from the ordinary cardiomyocytes. And I'll show you some of the some, uh, features later on. And the last point um, is how is that uh, the automaticity from the pacemaker cells uh, uh, are formed. And the, the spontaneous automaticity is driven by a, a clock mechanism. And there are two clocks. And this has been sort of um, postulated about 30 years ago and then fully um, uh, proven in the last uh, uh, decade that a membrane clock and calcium clock, two clock mechanisms drive the automaticity. And to put it in a simplistic manner, membrane clock means ion channels on the cell membrane um, orchestrate spontaneous action potential uh, firing. And then there is also spontaneous calcium release events that happens inside the cell, and that's the calcium clock one. And that spontaneous calcium release events are mediated by psychoplasmic uh, uh, psychoendoplasm reticulum, SR, uh, uh, in the cytoplasm. And those two clock systems uh, are sort of uh, redundant and, and gives redundancy and complement each other to give automaticity in the pacemaker cells. Now, it was uh, back in 2007 and uh, eight, um, um, and that was a review paper, where uh, Yamanaka, published the, the first IPS uh, uh, manuscripts. And then uh, Jamie Thompson followed uh, uh, a few months, few months later. And then uh, just a year uh, after that, we saw these papers published uh, by uh, a group in uh, Holland. And it was an opportune time because IPS was new. And then we became to learn that there are very important and specific transcription factors that, are, uh, that really guides the development of the pacemaker cells in the SA node or the formation of the SA node. The, the mammalian heart uh, starts as a tube, and then it becomes a chamber. So in the linear tubular heart, um, TBX18 is expressed in the sinus horn, which later becomes, in the mouse life, just the day after it becomes the sino, uh, sinoatrial node. Um, so we knew from these papers, from uh, uh, developmental biology papers, that there are specific T-box uh, transcription factors that are important for the SA node development, ventricular myocardium de development, or the uh, uh, outflow tract uh, development. And in fact, when the same group uh, knocked out uh, both copies of TBX18, 
the signature node was uh, gone by about 80%. So we knew that TBEX18 has to be really important, but the function of the TBEX18 uh, was not known. So being a simplistic scientist, we imagined what would happen if we add TBEX18, re-express that transcription factor in ordinary cardiac myocytes. One thing I didn't tell you is that TBEX18 is so important for forming the SA node of the structure, but the expression of TBEX18 goes away before we are born. So it has a very brief pulse-like uh, expression during embryonic life. In adult life, uh, there's no TBEX18. So that's why we imagine that uh, re-expressing this embryonic factor in, um, uh, in somatic uh, ventricular myocyte may be able to create uh, pacemaker cells. It was a sort of bold uh, and very simplistic uh, hypothesis. Fortunate to us, it, it actually worked. So one of the phenotypes that we saw right away was that expression of TBEX18 in regular ordinary cardiomyocyte really shut down some, uh, a gap junction protein called connexin 43. And gap junctions are tunnels in between cardiac myocytes. And these gap junctions allow movement of uh, uh, ionic uh, uh, ions as well as small molecules. And they are uh, uh, the gates where uh, the, uh, the electric, communica electric communication happens between cardiomyocytes. Connexin 43 is found in general myocardium, both in the ventricular myocardium and the atrial myocardium, but completely absent in the sinoatrial node. So when we express TBX18, it shut down the expression of connexin 43 in the ventricular myocardial myocytes uh, within uh, just two days after we expressed it. Um, and here is uh, gap junction proteins have sort of dot-like expression. So here is a punctate expression which is gone with TBX18. And that translated into slow conduction uh, velocity. So this is multi-electrode array recording. In control, the conduction velocity is about 14 centimeters per second. That's how fast it, the electrical wavefront um, uh, moves. When we added TBX18, it slowed down a lot by uh, more than uh, four times. Uh, so in other words, the decreased conduction velocity or slow conduction velocity that are shown, that are seen in the native SA node could be mimicked by adding TBX18 in, in vitro. And then we delivered the TBX18 uh, in an adenoviral vector into the animal heart. So we would uh, take the adenovirus expressing TBX18, directly inject it into the uh, red or guinea pig heart, suture up the animal, let the animal live for, for a few days, uh, a week to two weeks, and then bring the animals back. And then uh, um, study the effect of the TBX18 expression. TBX18 uh, in that vector had a GFP reporter, so green cells uh, indicate the TBX18 transduced cardiomyocytes. And this is sort of to an electrophysiologist a money shot because, uh, so this is a technique called uh, patch clamp where you, can, you take single live cells, use a sharp glass electrode, and then uh, have a very tight seal between the electrode and the cell and record electrical activity from that single cell. What we have done is to bring the animals back after a few days, isolate single cardiomyocytes, and we know which ones have TBX18 because the TBX18 transduced cardiomyocytes are green. And when we patch on those green TBX18 transduced cardiomyocytes, they showed oscillating action potentials that are almost indistinguishable from the gold standard, which is the pacemaker cells from the uh, sinoatrial node. So the sinoatrial node uh, pacemaker cells uh, fire action potentials uh, spontaneously and autonomously. This is uh, expanded scale of the same uh, cell. And you can record these cells for 30 minutes, one hour, two hours until you break the pipette. And we saw similar uh, phenotype in TBX18 transduced ventricular myocyte that we delivered in vivo. In contrast, the uh, controlled ventricular myocytes that were uh, 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 delivered with a GFP gene alone without TBX18 fired an action potential only when we injected a stimulatory depolarizing ion current. So once it fires an action potential, it stays quiet. 
as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, ventricular and atrial myo uh, cardiomyocytes are boring cells. They do not fire unless they are stimulated to do so. So uh, when we saw uh, these uh, electrophysiological properties of TBX18 uh, transduced ventricular myocytes, you can imagine we are really, really, really excited. Um, and what also got us uh, even more excited is that the efficiency of creating these spontaneously beating cells, cardiomyocytes, with a single transcription factor was really high. This uh, is a, a video uh, of a, uh, a ventricular myocyte derived, isolated from a young uh, red heart. And young red heart bec being uh, neonatal stage, they have a little bit of uh, automaticity. So you can see, and this is, uh, these cells are loaded with calcium dye. So whenever calcium spikes happen, you can see cells flashing. And this, uh, uh, in control case, um, a few cells flash calcium or uh, exhibit oscillating calcium once in a while. In TBEX18 transduced cardiomyocytes, it was almost a firework. So uh, the singular re-expression of TBEX18 TBX not only creates oscillating uh, action potentials, but the efficiency of doing it at least in, in in vitro is really high. And another phenotype that I mentioned that the pacemaker cells uh, have uh, or, or different from the uh, general cardiomyocytes, that they look very different. And here is a uh, immunostaining. Uh, this is from the uh, native heart. So when we do, um, when we take the heart and section the signature node, and then uh, look at the SA node, which can be found using a, uh, a uh, uh, antibody against the HCN4 channel, which is found in the SA node alone we can find, demarcate where the SA node is. And the SA node is here, surrounded by uh, the right atrium cardiomyocytes. The white staining is a uh, myofilament, a sarcomeric actinin staining. And this uh, myofilament protein is highly expressed in the atrial myocytes, but sparsely expressed in the cyanoatrial node uh, pacemaker cells. And when we did uh, in vitro experiment, adding TBEX18 in the uh, uh, ventricular myocytes derived from neonatal red, the highly organized uh, sarcomeric actinin staining uh, or, or, or uh, expression pattern was diminished uh, by TBEX18. And even the orientation uh, is in disarray, indicating that um, the myogenic, muscle generating, force generating properties of pacemaker cells are less. In fact, um, I should have had a video of uh, native pacemaker cell twitching. Pacemaker cells, their function is not to provide mechanical force to the heart. Their function is to generate electrical uh, stimulation, but they do twitch. Uh, but the, the, the amount of force that they, they generate is far less than uh, red, regular cardiomyocytes from the ventricular and atrial myocardium. And here is um, another immunostaining that we performed on cells isolated from the heart. So we would inject TBEX18, and then a few days later, we'll uh, isolate single cells. In control animals injected with TB uh, GFP uh, vector alone, uh, you will see sarcomeric actin um, organization that are uh, beautifully and regularly spaced. Um, in the uh, pacemaker cells, uh, isolated from the SA node, so these, these are the native pacemaker cells, there's one, two, three cells sort of clumped together. And these cells are sort of narrow, smaller, and have squiggly ends. And their alpha actinin um, uh, organization is uh, 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 in sort of a random orientation. When we looked at the ventricular myocytes that took up the TBEX18, uh, their expression was also uh, less, and, uh, less in amount and less in organization. And also, they lost some weight. Um, the muscle cells are very plump and large. And these cells became narrow with uh, squiggly ends um, and tapering ends. And that is 
very similar to what uh, you would see in native pacemaker cells. And this, I have to admit, is not something that we looked for. It, it, the, the data came to us and really surprising. And, and this is something, the morphological change of the uh, cell, cells by TBX18 is something that we are uh, looking into actively. Now, I mentioned that pacemaker cells should respond to autonomic, autonomic regulation, and this is in vitro demonstration where we used MEA, and this is a, a, a baseline TBX18 transduced uh, cardiomyocytes when we add beta adrenergic stimulation with isoprotenol, beating rate speeds up. Um, and then when we challenge it with uh, acetyl uh, choline, cholinergic suppression, the beating rate suppress goes down. Um, here is a uh, in vivo data. Um, so we take the guinea pigs um, and bring the lab, uh, bring back to the lab, and then we make the animal sleepy, and we hook up uh, surface EKGs uh, on its body and record uh, electrocardiograms. And the guinea pigs and rats, their uh, baseline heart rate is about 280 to 320 beats per minute, it's really fast. There's no way we can uh, observe, we thought, uh, the, the pacing that's provided by the TBX18 uh, biological pacemaker. So we had to slow down its baseline heart rate using chemical, it's dirty, uh, but it does what we want it to do. So by adding uh, methacholine, cholinologically suppress its sinus rhythm. When we suppress it, a lot, the animal experiences something called complete heart block, and that's a dissociation of the sinus rhythm and the a, AV node. So uh, the atrial myocardium is paced by the sinus uh, uh, node, and the ventricular myocardium is paced by the AV node. So, um, and you can see that here. This large uh, peak, it, that's called QRS signal, and that's ventricular beat, boom, boom, boom. And then, this uh, small bead here, um, here, 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 that's called P wave, and that's depolarization of the atrial myocardium. And that P wave, in normal heart, in, in my heart, in all, all, uh, uh, your heart, P wave uh, precedes the uh, QRS wave all the time, because atria beats first and then the ventricular myocardium. But here, with uh, AV dissociation, the P wave uh, beats at the beat of its own drummer, uh, uh, dissociated from the QRS. That's control animals injected with uh, GFP. In animals injected t with TBX18, it shows, number one, the QRS rate is faster than the control animals. And the QRS morphology is negative, downward reflection compared to this guy. And that's by design. We injected TBX18 at the bottom part of the heart uh, and usually, cardiac conduction fr starts from the top and spreads to the bottom. And if the pacing comes from the bottom, then it's a retrograde activation, and the, the polarity of the ventricular activation should be negative, and that's what we see. The third thing that we can extract um, is um, this QRS, which is depolarization of the ventricular myocardium, occurs through the cardiac conduction system, through the bundles, and the Purkinje fibers, and it's really fast. So it's pencil, pencil sharp. TBX18 mediated pacing of the heart because we inject it into ventricular myocardium, and it just utilizes normal cell-cell coupling of the uh, regular cardiomyocytes. It's not very fast. So you can actually see a widening of the QRS uh, uh, here, here. So use, analyzing those three things we um, uh, demonstrate that uh, injection of the TBX18 can create biological pacing in a small animal model. This is a summary of the data where we created ISAN, induced SAN-like pacemaker cells, and they beat spontaneously and autonomously utilize the clock system uh, for the automaticity, and the morphology changes and it's responsive to the autonomic regulation. In the last uh, seven minutes, I'm going to tell you what we have done to take the bench science to something close to clinical realization. And we uh, modified uh, one of the uh, animal labs on the top floor of our, our research building to something that you would see in, in clinical lab, in, in a cat lab. And this is the real lab uh, where uh, Adrian 
uh, I'm sorry, uh, James and Adrian uh, was uh, uh, helping us uh, to do a pig study. So this is a model where we would get um, about 50 to 60 kilogram farm pigs. And um, uh, we first created the model in this paper where, um, uh, this is a model, where uh, we would first go in with radio frequency catheter, whoops, I'm sorry. We would uh, first implant a electronic pacemaker device into the pig. And the pig will be uh, paced by the pacing device with a, a lead at the uh, right ventricular apex right here, not shown in this cartoon. And then uh, we would go in with a, a radio frequency catheter and burn the atrioventricular node. Basically, you barbecue it. When you burn this one, the sinus node is fine. It's, it's uh, working fine. But that signal cannot be captured by the AV node. So uh, if in effect, you have an AV node uh, dissociation. So the ventricular myocardium then uh, will not be able to pace. So the pacing then comes from the electronic pacemaker device that we implanted. And we had to do it because once you create the AV block, the pig will die. Most of the pig uh, will die you know, within the uh, first uh, 30 minutes. Then we would go in with an injection uh, catheter and inject our TBX18 right here downstream of where we burnt. Uh, and the idea is um, if we create an automaticity in the high his bundle uh, region, then that automaticity will be able to use the autobahn of the cardiac electrical system and capture the animal's heart. Uh, and that would be much, uh, we, we demonstrated in this paper, uh, that was uh, much uh, more efficient than injecting the gene into just a general myocardium. And, um, this is one of the cases where large animal experiment is actually easier to do what we want to do compared to small animal because there, with small animal model, there's no way we can do this uh, fine um, uh, localization. Now, one thing is all this procedure is a minimally invasive. There's, there's no open heart. Uh, so the delivery uh, of uh, the gene, ablation of the, uh, the AV node, everything is done by cut down of the right femoral uh, vein. So, uh, this is something that can, is done in clinical uh, situations as an outpatient procedure. Uh, that's the injection catheter. Uh, you can record electrical signal with electrode and then the needle comes out. We can control it from uh, the other end and inject the, um, uh, our uh, gene. Here's the most important data from the animal study. Uh, this is control animal injected with GFP. That's uh, pigs injected with TBEX18. And it was a 14-day, two-week study. And about two days after we uh, injected the gene, the TBX18 animals uh, started, to ha started to have a uh, mean heart rate that was much uh, higher than the control pigs, uh, somewhere between uh, 70 beats per minute to 80 beats per minute. The resting heart rate of the pigs is about 90, 92 beats per minute. So uh, the biological pacing that we achieved uh, was not exactly the resting uh, heart rate of the pigs, but close. And we were able to maintain that uh, sort of uh, biological pacing for uh, two weeks of the study period. And um, one word here, we set the electronic pacemaker pacing rate at 50 bits per minute. Uh, most of the time, the pigs are uh, paced by its escape rhythm coming from uh, uh, the his bundle area. So in other words, when human, when we have uh, 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 problems with sinus rhythm, we have a slow junctional escape rhythm coming from the his bundle area. And that was a little faster than the, uh, the device rate that we set up. So basically, the device was a backup uh, uh, pacing. So, so I'm guessing that lower right panel, you got the device set up in one of the conditional pacing modes. Precisely. Precisely. Exactly. We wanted to ask the pigs how they were feeling. And we thought one way to ask them is to measure uh, uh, their activity. And the cage was about, about uh, this big, uh, about um, uh, seven by uh, nine feet. Um, and the 
the um, telemetry, uh, telemetry device that we implanted to measure their uh, EKG also had accelerometer that's part of your smartphone. So accelerometer measures acti uh, basically a vector change over a given time. And that uh, arbitrary mean activity was higher in TBX18 compared to uh, control animals. And when they moved around in bursts, that burst of activity uh, was uh, longer and they took uh, uh, less uh, shorter breaks between those uh, bursts of activity. Um, this is the last uh, data slide where we wanted to look, find out where the pacing was coming from. And I mentioned that we implanted uh, uh, a cardiac uh, electronic pacing devices uh, and paced the uh, heart uh, from the RV apex. On day one, day, uh, the day when we injected the, uh, the gene, both TBX18 animals and GFP animals were being paced by, uh, from the RV uh, right ventricular apex where we inserted the uh, pace, uh, pacing lead because the TBX18 gene, it, it takes some time for the gene to express. Uh, at the uh, last day of the study period, day 14, the TBX18 pig's pacing was coming from the uh, side of the heart uh, where we presumably injected uh, our gene, whereas the control animals were uh, still being paced by the uh, RVA pigs. So in this paper, um, we demonstrate for the first time that the biological pacemaker concept works in a large animal model. And it's important to emphasize that this is a Im minimally invasive uh, uh, procedure and right-sided uh, vein uh, delivery of the uh, uh, transgene um, and injection into the his bundle. Uh, the physiological rate, uh, uh, close to physiological rate, uh, uh, was uh, achieved for 14 days. We followed two animals up to three months, and those animals still had uh, about 70 to 75 uh, beats per minute uh, uh, rate. The, one of the, re the main reason why we did two week uh, study period was, it, it was because it was phenomenally expensive to do this kind of study. Uh, cost about a million dollar uh, for uh, 30 animal studies. So, um, and uh, it reduces dependence on the electronic pacemaker device. We think that the first in human clinical trial does not have to be a home run. In other words, um, we think uh, e even if we think um, the patients who already have electronic pacemaker devices and, and uh, uh, permanently depend on, it, dependent on it could also receive biological pacemaker genes. And that, if that works, uh, it could reduce the dependence uh, of the patients on the device and allow the patients to uh, buy more time between battery change. So that could be uh, one, uh, uh, first uh, a first clinical trial that we can imagine. Uh, the problems, well, the, uh, the things that we have to solve with the reprogramming is that uh, the efficiency of reprogramming could be random. We're injecting the gene into the rat, guinea pigs, and pigs, and uh, uh, taking up the gene by the uh, cardiomyocytes is something uh, that, uh, that are left by, uh, to chance. The fate of the reprogrammed cells need to be characterized, and this, this is uh, uh, a problem, um, because there is not a single necessary and sufficient marker for cardiac pacemaker cells. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem that we, we, we think about it on a daily basis, how to solve the problem um, uh, using, and, and do some lineage tracing uh, 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 experiment. Here is the future, now and future. This is a uh, signature node um, dissected out from a rat. And we did that maybe two months ago, three months ago, um, loaded with a calcium dye. It's a beautiful structure. It's end to end, it's about a millimeter, maybe two millimeters uh, big, along. Um, what we have done, we and others have done, is to create biological pacemaker cells in the last decade. We want to evolve away um, from creating pacemaker cells towards pacemaker nodes. Because our heart is not being paced by the cells in a random manner. Uh, the cells make up a nodal structure, and it's the node that paces the atrial myocardium. So we want to get there. And what Sandra is doing 
is to come up with a uh, way to do this in a 2D. And uh, she's uh, working on a microfluidics uh, uh, design where the whole blue and red area will be plated with regular ordinary cardiomyocytes. And then she would flow in TBX18. And by regulating the flow rate, we can make this red area uh, with TBX18 smaller or larger. And we want to see how many cells are needed to be able to pace the surrounding uh, 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 ordinary cardiomyocytes. So that would be a 2D model. And there are 3D models uh, that we are thinking uh, in terms of spheroids as well. So the SA node is uh, very, very small, but elaborate, highly specialized. There is a ion channel, stem cell, and reprogram approaches to creating engineered biopacers. Um, and we have, and we continue to um, uh, try our concept in, in a large animal model uh, for clinical translation. And that's the future, creating an engineered uh, 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 essay node. And this is the, the most important slide. Uh, these are my colleagues and friends at Cedar sinai um, uh, in Los Angeles, where um, um, these people were uh, responsible for the in vitro and small animal model experiments and the work that we've published. And then um, Eugenio Singolani is uh, my friend who spearheaded and did a lot of uh, large animal studies. And the torch has been uh, carried by uh, Sandra and uh, other scientists in our lab. And here are um, our collaborators, um, Dr. Shin, who's in the audience. Um, we are collaborating with her to look at uh, zebrafish model and how that zebrafish model can help us understand the formation of the SA node. And in fact, the zebrafish video that I showed you uh, during the first uh, two minutes is the one from uh, Dr. Shin's uh, lab. And uh, Dr. with Dr. Uh, Charles Zhang, who's also in the audience, we're looking at uh, sort of metabolic differences between the cardiac pacemaker cells and regular uh, ordinary my uh, uh, myocytes. And here, conceptually, we think the pacemaker cells ha should have a little bit of difference in terms of its, uh, its metabolism. Um, it would, in other words, um, when, when we uh, experience hypoxia, with ischemic injury, uh, the pacemakers, we cannot afford to lose uh, the pacing ability. So over the course of a uh, few uh, uh, thousands of years, we may have evolved some metabolic uh, uh, differences in the pacemaker cells uh, that are different from the uh, uh, muscle cells. Uh, and that's, uh, that work is being pursued with the help of Dr. Zhang. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Ah, it's that short answer, we don't, I don't know, uh, because uh, no one has studied that. Uh, the, we, but we know from uh, the, the degree of myofilaments, um, actinins, myosin heavy chains, uh, alpha and beta, their myofilament expression pattern resembles fetal type, not uh, adult type. So uh, they are perhaps equipped to be less contractile. Um, whether they are actually softer cells, that's also a, a, a very interesting uh, uh, question. The, they share the, you know, what begets pacemaker cells. And when we go back, uh, they have some resemblance to uh, so-called second heart field uh, cells, progenitor cells during uh, cardiac uh, development. And the second heart field cells give rise to uh, chamber myocytes as well. So I, 
I don't know how soft those cells will be. One hypothesis that we are working on is to see whether pacemaker cells are actually cells that are trapped in adolescence uh, or forever young cells. Uh, and that's because when, when the linear heart tube uh, forms, um, they begin to beat. And cardiomyocytes, uh, ordinary ventricular atrial cardiomyocytes, have the ability to pace on its own um, it, during the embryonic life and up to about late fetal life. By the time they are uh, they start, uh, we start breathing oxygen, we lose it. So uh, we, we think, we, we, we're working on this hypothesis where the pacemaker cells may have some uh, uh, properties that uh, uh, hinder them from maturing further to, towards uh, 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 working uh, myocytes. Right. So an important part of a normal, healthy, and optimally functioning heart is there are some well-defined, um, I'll call them spatial and geometrical aspects of the anatomy. So for example, using your pig example, there are many cases in humans when you have ectopic pacing sites or junctional AV rhythms, sure the heart's beating and the person's alive, but there's long-term health effects of that heart not operating efficiently, whether it's on circulation, long-term effects of that poor circulation. And to use another example at the beginning of your talk, one of the solutions that exists in mammals for that sino, for that SA to atrial loading problem, and you're probably well aware of this, is that there are fingers of atrial tissue that actually interdigitate the SA node, and that drastic change in surface area is what allows the SA node to conduct the atrial node. And so I'm throwing these two out of, two out of examples because I suspect that you and your peers, whether you're pursuing stem cells or reprogramming, probably have to think about or worry about long term how you're going to deal with these sort of spatial anatomical aspects of cellular reprogramming. How to get the cells in a certain spatial arrangement or where you want them to go. Oh, that's so. Any thoughts about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a wonderful point. And that's precisely what uh, we, we talk about every day uh, with Sandra and other lab members. Um, as you mentioned um, in your second uh, part of the comment, the SA node uh, is surrounded by the atrial myocardium. And and um, in the core of the SA node, in, in the core of the SA node, there are mostly pacemaker cells. In the periphery of the SA node that borders the atrial myocardium, there is a lot of infiltration of atrial myocytes that are going in. That structure, uh, I think it's a little difficult to uh, design uh, um, spontaneously. In other words, uh, what we may want to do is to have a strategy where we start with uh, TBEX18 uh, in the center, and then uh, using uh, microfluidics or maybe some uh, PDMS wafer uh, design, uh, give other transcription factors in the periphery. And, and the reason why I'm saying this is because TBEX18 is not the only one that uh, guides or determines the SA node development. And there's SHOX2 that I mentioned, there's TBEX3. So at least there are three different transcription factors. What we know uh, now is that during the embryonic life, TBEX18 and SHOX2 are contemporary. They do, they first, uh, they pulse and go away, and then TBEX3 comes in during the late embryonic uh, life and then stays with us. So. Um, perhaps that has something to do with um, the special organization of the SA node. Um, the strands coming in, the atrial, uh, atrial cardiomyocyte strands coming into the uh, uh, SA node, um, uh, we, we are at uh, our infancy in, in sort of designing now. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Way. Yeah. Uh, to make the matter a little more, even more complicated, uh, is that the SA node is not uh, pacemaker cells and atrial myocytes. It's got 
uh, pacemaker cells and there are uh, something called transitional cells that have HDL myocyte looking like morphology, but they pace on, it, on their own. So there seems to be some gradient of uh, cell uh, 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 identity uh, with, even within the SA node. So the, the structure is, uh, we have the work cut out for us to study that structure, to say the least. Dr. Shin. Yeah, that's. So, but using this, just, just this one gene, can you kind of convert the dendritic myocyte into the SA, SA and myocyte? Why do you think that there's this kind of very tangent expression? Because we can look at the tissue and just completely throw that cell from the myocyte into the SA myocyte. The short answer is I showed. All the data that looks like it's a complete reprogramming, but it may not be. Um, in other words, uh, we haven't really tested the uh, uh, neuronal regulation of the autonomic regulation of the, the reprogrammed pacemaker cells in full extent. Uh, we do not know, again, I mentioned this uh, briefly, we do not know how long the TBX18 reprogrammed cells will stay reprogrammed for months, years. Perhaps it needs uh, the uh, encouragement from the TBX3 uh, as well as SHOX2. Um, and that's the experiment that we are doing now. Uh, we are making combinatorial uh, strategies where we do TBX18 with SHOX2, TBX18 with TBX3, all three together in different combinations and different time points um, to mimic what we see in the, during the embryonic development. And um, we uh, this is a data from last week where um, what we are doing also is take a piece of cardiac uh, tissue from the ventricular myocardium, very small meat, and then just add virus and put them onto a petri dish and observe. And when we do it with GIP, control virus, this tissue just stays as cardiac uh, ventricular myocardium meat. When we added TBX18, they start to twitch uh, about a week later. When we added TBX18 with SHOX2, they twitch within two days. So we know that when we, do, when we combine uh, these factors together, we can increase the efficiency um, uh, much more. That's is there a response to TBX18? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. At the, uh, um, we, we haven't tested it to, to learn a lot, but what we know is if we have too much TBX18, it kills the cells. At the beginning, um, you know, thinking that uh, to reprogram, if you take a lesson from IPS, um, um, from fibroblast to IPS creation, one wants to infect the cells as much as possible with uh, reprogramming factors. Um, and we did that with TBX18 and we realized uh, it was killing the cells at the same dose as the control GFP virus. So GFP virus at uh, MOI multiplicity of infection of uh, 10 were perfectly happy with TBX18 was killing cells. So we had to tone it down by more than tenfold with TBX18 to see the phenotype and be able to convert them without killing them. Is there a regulator that um, regulates the TBX18? Um, How does it turn off after postnatal? Oh, yeah, we don't know. Um, we, we're sort of uh, uh, standing in on the outside and letting the embryo uh, develop and the biologist to do the homework. Uh, <laughs> um, there are some other factors uh, that seem to regulate the sinoatrial node program, such as PITX, PIT uh, uh, transcription factors, and um, that may be an inhibitory, uh, that may impart an inhib inhibitory influence on the pacemaker gene program. Well, thank you very much for uh, your attention.